Please help me welcome our speakers for the morning. Dr. George Dragovsky is Professor of Astronomy and Data Science at Caltech and Director of Caltech Center for Data-Driven Discovery. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1985 and joined the Caltech faculty two years later in 1987. The recipient of numerous honors and distinctions, Professor Dragovsky is a founder of the Virtual Observatory <laughs> and is author and co-author of several hundred scholarly publications. Asteroid 24421 is named in his honor. And with that, Professor Dragovsky, welcome to the Greenway Talks Online. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end. <clears throat> During the presentation, feel free to type questions into the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll pick them up during the Q&A session. So for now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, George, please welcome. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Steve. Good morning, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's always a pleasure to do something with or for Palomar Observatory. All right. So uh, today I'd like to tell you more how, in fact, astronomy as a whole is changing dramatically, driven by the big data and computer technology. Um, and Palomar has actually played a very significant role in all that. So over the years, I worked with a number of excellent people. I mentioned just two of my current collaborators, Matthew Graham, Ashish Mahabal, um, but there were many, many others and many students from Caltech that really made all these things happen. So I'd like to start by pointing out that we actually live in historically unprecedented time that what's happened over the last few decades is like a combination of the Industrial Revolution and invention of a printing press combined and squeezed in a space of a couple of decades. And the rapid pace of technology is so fast that a lot of people simply cannot catch up. A lot of our social upheavals are also due to that mismatch of, of rates of progress. So, Usually people talk about big data because that's the, like the one vis highly visible aspect of the new revolution, computationally enabled revolution in sciences, society at large. And it turns out that in most fields, astronomy included, the amount of data doubles every year and a half. And that sounds familiar because that's Moore's law that the devices that actually produce our data, like digital detectors, also follow the same uh, trend, more as a lot of doubling in capacity every year and a half. And think about what this really means. It means that a year and a half from now will generate as much data as in all of the past history. And then again, and again, and again. Um, in some fields, it's even faster, like in biology. So, that is the highly visible part that drives a lot of change that I'll describe. But equally important, maybe more important, is the growth of data complexity. That data are no longer like single number measured for something. They're usually tens, hundreds, thousands of numbers and not just numbers. And they'll be operating in many dimensions and data will be heterogeneous and mixed and so on. And so that complexity is where a lot of useful information is hidden and needs to be extracted from. And besides, you know, if you, if you deal with something that's complex in nature, simple measurements won't do. We've done all the simple stuff. Now it's time to tackle really complex things. So this has changed uh, a number of important givens. Like we moved from data poverty to exponential overabundance of data. It used to be in science that data were the currency of the realm. If you have the data, you can do science. And now there is just so much data out there that having data or even just access to the data 
is not terribly valuable or, or expensive, I should say. Um, what's really valuable is knowing how to extract actionable knowledge from these data. We also move from data sets that are kind of taken once and never changed into evolving data sets that always get recalibrated, added, changed in some way. Um, and data streams, the data just keep coming at you and synoptic sky surveys like currently ZTF are a good example of that. But actually, um, for a lot of data analysis, algorithmically, it's better if you can only go through data once because data are so large. So even stationary data sets become data stream. In fact. Well, if you really have so much data that you actually have to analyze and react to them in real time, that because something important happened and you know you may want to follow it up immediately, you have to move from leisurely data analysis that can be done any time after the data are obtained into the real time, which has all the same challenges plus more. You have to do it fast, and that that is what creates both good opportunities and some challenges. So another thing that changed the sociological aspect of science is that we moved from highly centralized system where there would be like one place that's the world's leading place in X and that's where all the data are or you know some library or something into highly distributed um, system of data in the world. So there are many, many data contributors and providers in astronomy. Those will be observatories and sky surveys and space missions um, and even supercomputers. Um, and that means that not any single institution can really kind of dominate the field. And that has a lot of interesting consequences. And, and it has to be done that way because um, that's what where the data come from. So you have to have ways of combining and finding the data. Okay, so what's really new here, um, as opposed to same old stuff, but with more data? And there are three things that I could think of. Uh, the first one is that for the first time in history, we cannot see all of our data. I mean, data come at such a pace that you just can't look at it all. Um, so you have to have technology that will do that for you reliably. The second one is more profound, which is the increase in information content through data complexity as well as data volumes, data rates. And so that has given rise of what we call data-driven versus hypothesis-driven science, which is a little bit of artificial. You know, in traditionally, you say, well, somebody's got a great idea, hypothesis, then there is an experiment to check it, and, and ta-da, there is a result. In reality, there are always some feedback loops in all the steps. And so now the difference is that let the data tell you what's in the data. The, we map the real world into some data set. And if we do a good job, we capture all of the interesting or information bearing parts thereof, like sky survey in some wavelength, will capture everything there is, module the parameters of the survey. And you need not know what to expect in all of that. You just grab all of the stuff that can be measured in a reasonable fashion. And then instead of observing the sky with a telescope and an instrument, you're observing the archive using software instruments. And you, know, you can make discoveries in the data themselves. Now it's, it's now possible, in fact, I've seen it done increasingly, that you can be a great observational astronomer and, and make observational discovery and never see telescope in your life because the data have been already taken and they're made publicly available. But there is more to the complexity because we're pretty sure that now there are meaningful constructs in our data that are simply too complex for humans to understand unaided, which is where machine intelligence comes in and where you're starting to use artificial intelligence as a, as a prosthesis, if you will. That, but like any other technology ever, it enhances some 
human capability, you know, starting with grabbing the first sticks and stones, you know, enhanced the ability and, and any technology since then, like you can ride car faster and you can run, you can actually fly an airplane and so on. Well, now we have technology that is actually enhancing our mental abilities to comprehend vast amounts of stuff that's been measured. Okay, so how much data are we talking about? Um, astronomy was always on kind of forefront of these developments among many sciences. Um, although nowadays I think biology is really leading the charge. So I set up to try to estimate how much data is there in astronomy. And it turns out this is a really hard thing to do, that even people who run large data centers don't know how much data they have because it grows so fast. And so my best guess as of, oh, maybe a year ago, is that we now have 500 petabytes, give or take factor of two, properly archived and calibrated and stored in some archive somewhere. And I may be off by some factor. And anyhow, it changes every year and a half is going to be double that. So currently, astronomy collects of the order of a petabyte worth of data per day, but that's just raw data. And then usually when you do proper analysis, it shrinks somewhat. And so, for example, ZTF generates a petabyte per year. Um, but in terms of the raw data, it's, it's more than that. Astron radio astronomers are really the biggest bit producers, but the raw bits somehow don't count, right? The new thing, well, over the past 20 or so years, is that most of the astronomical data come from large surveys, not from big, expensive telescopes and spacecraft. Um, and so just for a comparison, on the bottom of the slide, I've given some yardsticks that human genome is less than a gigabyte, right? And human memory, well, that is questionable. Um, I've seen that number varies by many orders of magnitude, but geometrical mean maybe of the order of a gigabyte. In other words, your laptop can remember a lot more than you can. I totally believe that. My laptop remembers hell of a lot more than I can. And if you just encode text as simple, you know, ASCII characters, although nowadays that's not how it's done, a terabyte, which is kind of standard unit these days, is like two million books printed books. Um, so then the question is, how much information can you actually process per unit time? And again, that depends on what form it is, but it's roughly speaking a terabyte per year. And you cannot read 2 million books per year, but if you watch videos, you go through many, many more bits, although their valuable information content isn't quite as high as reading books. So this is why the first thing that I said, we cannot look at all of our data anymore. And so here is a, an example. This is an image of the sky as seen by Gaia satellite. And it actually isn't an image. It is, it is a reconstruction from a Gaia catalog that they plop down you know, as much signal in a pixel as there is stars in that pixel. And there are about 2 billion stars uh, contributing to this image. And it looks just like Milky Way panoramas that you've seen before. Now, for each of those, they measure tens or hundreds of numbers, and ground-based surveys do the same thing. So we detect of the order of billions of sources on the sky, and for each of them, we measure typically hundreds of numbers, um, and then do it again and again and again and moving from this panoramic cosmic photography to panoramic cosmic cinematography. That's a lot of data. Um, you can't quite do that on your laptop. But it gets more interesting that the universe looks different in different wavelengths because different physical processes emit most of their energy in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here is a patch of a sky in galactic bulge, exact same patch of the sky in the near infrared, which is like visible light in the upper left, far infrared in the upper right. And you can see that there is symmetry where you see dust lanes signal missing in the visible image. That's where signal comes from in far infrared. That's the dust that's been re-emitting that energy has been absorbed. 
And in lower left, well, it's ionized gas, which again gives you a whole different picture of the universe. And on the right, X-ray sources, dead stars mostly. So if you confine yourself to any given wavelength regime, you get a highly biased picture of what's going on. And so you have to bring together the data from a variety of wavelengths to get really complete image. And now we also have not just panchromatic universe, but uh, synoptic universe that we look at this as a function of time. And that adds the complexity to the whole thing. Now, meanwhile, our theory colleagues have not been idle either. Um, and they're doing a lot of numerical simulations of things like galaxy and structure formation shown here. Each cube is a three-dimensional snapshot of one of the simulations, but things like supernova explosions or star formation, et cetera, et cetera. And they do this with big computers and they generate output that is of comparable size in terms of bits as these large sky surveys. So they're not data, data like measurements, but they are data except synthetic. All right, there are data that correspond in some sense to theoretical observations of a, some synthesized you know, part of the universe in the computer. And so this is an interesting methodological shift that theory statement is no longer a formula or set of formulas. Theory statement is now a data set. And that data set needs to be matched to the real observational data sets in, in order to understand what's going on. Now, the reason why they do this is not just because they're too lazy to write a lot of equations, but because it's a priori impossible to solve analytically a lot of complex phenomena. And the simplest example of this is if you take just good old Newtonian gravity, point masses, if you have two of them, that's Kepler's problem, you know, they orbit around common center of mass. Any physics student can solve this in half a page. If you add third mass point, there is no analytical solution. And that was proven analytically by Poincaré 100 plus years ago that there is no analytical solution. So if you have a galaxy of few hundred billion mass points merging with another galaxy with few hundred billion mass points, you can see what the problem is. You cannot do this analytically a priori. You have to mimic in the computer what Mother Nature does out there. And then if you do the job right, then maybe that can lead you some insight. And it's the physics that's behind it is very simple. It's just Newtonian gravity. M1 times M2 divided by radius squared. That's all there is to it. And yet you produce these amazing structures that you could not possibly have foreseen unless you actually do the computation. Okay, so astronomy is a science then over the last quarter century or thereabouts. Transition from, what well, we say, subsistence agriculture to the industrial production, right? And so we move from rare, hardly obtained data into this massive, massive data of our production. And all that is due to a single technology, which is VLSI uh, integration, the circuit chips and the are in every electronic device these days, which, by the way, uh, were partly invented by Carver Mead at Caltech, um, who just won a uh, Kyoto Prize for that. So that's what drives this doubling every year and a half. Um, and then you do something in the machine. Remember, we're using software instruments to observe data. Uh, and data hopefully capture what's really there on the sky. So all, that's where all the action is. So all this expensive hardware that we have, you know, James Webb telescope, CAC telescopes, well, that's just the hardware front end. The real business happens in the computers once the data are sucked into the archives and then some machine learning is unleashed in that, which is then implying it's a whole different skill set that scientists in 21st centuries had to have and um, I'm first to admit that we in academia have not been doing a really good job in, in teaching our students these skills, largely because most professors don't know them, um, but students somehow on their own manage to learn them. And you know that's what the new generation is. 
So there are now really two different kinds of observational astronomy. There is the traditional observational astronomy where you just observe some interesting things or small number of interesting things with a big telescope, 200 inch Keck, Webb, and so on, take spectra. And they don't produce very much data by present standards. They produce some really useful, important data, but um, in terms of the sheer data volume, now nah. the real winners are small telescopes where surveys are done, like the 48 inch. Um, and they cover large areas in the sky that don't go as deep, but they capture lots and lots of sources. Same thing for space based observatories, like this, I think is a Spitzer. Um, and so then the images are processed, you identify objects, stars, galaxies, whatever, you measure a whole bunch of stuff, you put that in an archive. And then you unleash your software instruments, machine learning tools to find interesting things in the data that have been collected. Then you follow up those with the big guns, the ground-based or space-based telescopes. And that turned out to be enormously powerful way of going about it. You've kind of optimized the use of your most expensive asset, which is the big telescopes in, on ground or in space. And that's what has led to a, all number of, a number of important recent discoveries. Well, Palomar has led the world in sky surveys for many decades now. Uh, I mean, people have done sky surveys with naked eye, starting with Hipparchos and Ptolemy, right? But um, with the advent of photography, it became possible to do, you know, observation that's then preserved to be studied later on. Well, Fritz Zwicky, of course, built the first telescope at Palomar, the 18-inch Schmidt camera. The picture in the lower right is uh, Bernard Schmidt, the optician who invented that particular optical configuration. And he was also apparently a very interesting character. So Zwicky, being a genius, recognized that that's exactly what you need. And what Zwicky wanted to do is find supernovae, which were the big deal in late 30s with Walter Bade. They figured out that they're neutron stars and so on. Well, in, supernovae are rare, relatively speaking. And so in order to find a lot of supernovae to study, you have to cover lots of galaxies and again and again. And that's why Zwicky built a telescope. So this is kind of great granddaddy of ZTF. Um, and uh, that was obviously a really good thing because 200 inch also doesn't have a very large field of view. With 48 inch, we have six and a half degree field of view. With 200 inch, maybe 20 arc minutes or so. Um, and so you can't cover large areas in the sky. So that is the role of the 48 inch, you know, from the beginning of the observatory, find targets for the 200 inch. Well, that was done again and again. First in 1930s, 40s, Zwicky was surveying sky with, using his 18 inch Schmidt um, in process, documenting among the first people, the large scale structure in the universe with catalogs of galaxies and clusters and so on. Um, and then 18 inch was used to look for near Earth asteroids. In 1950s, the first Palomar sky survey was done, two thirds of the sky that's visible from Palomar in two filters. And that was the first time there was like a modern roadmap for northern and some of the southern sky. Um, that had a huge impact all across the astronomy. So you can do some science just with sky survey, but most of the time you're, you're using it to support observations with big telescopes. And then in the decades that followed, many smaller surveys were done to look for fast moving stars and quasars and whatnot, um, including the Palomar Quick V survey, which was used by Space Telescope Science Institute to do the first guide star catalog for Hubble. Um, and then uh, from late 80s uh, th through mid 90s, we had the second Palomar Sky Survey, which was this sort of like new improved version of the old one. And it was the last large photographic sky survey ever, right? 
So those plates were then digitized uh, by several groups, including Space Telescope Institute again, and we shared those scans with them. And so they made a new guide star catalog for Hubble, which is still used, and we did all manner of other stuff. And so that was our first foray into digital sky survey, digitizing the old photographic plates. When I first arrived to Caltech, they were just starting POS2, um, and I thought, God, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard because everything is digital these days. You know, you have to have data in digital form. Now, of course, you couldn't pave focal plane 48 inch with CCDs. So that's why they opted for the old fashioned plates. That's one of the reasons, but, but I thought in order to do any science with this, we have to digitize it and we did. And then that led into fully digital surveys as the devices that take data CCDs became bigger and relatively cheaper. And so you can start covering a good chunk and now essentially almost all of the focal plane of the 48 inch, not letting anything go to waste. And that's essentially how things are done these days. And, the, and there's a number of different sky surveys operating today, not just at Palomar, but other observatories as well but all following the same kind of philosophy. You don't use big telescopes to survey the sky. You use big telescopes to learn more about especially interesting things that you will find with smaller telescopes. So here is the field of view illustration. This is one of the deep bus plate scans, obviously not a random plate, you know, not all of them have Andromeda in it, but one of these would in addition to big galaxies like that, would have about 50,000 stars, 50,000 faint galaxies, depending where you look, um, over a six and a half degree field. When I put down a picture of the moon to scale, 200 inch field of view with a good corrector is a little less than the size of full, full moon. Keck, less yet. Hubble, even yes, and James W. Webb spell stuff, even less. And so you see the point. Right, so surveys uh, does cover a huge amount of sky, often repeatedly, and um, the amount of data grows exponentially. Here is my simple version of what the uh, evolution of astronomical data is like in time. And so, in the 1980s, we started with first digital imagers um, going into megabyte regime. Uh, megabytes were a big deal. And then by early uh, 90s, we started talking about gigabyte data sets. And then first sky service had multiple terabytes and so on. And now we are like into almost exabyte regime. Um, as data sources, data volumes, data rates keep increasing, we had to learn new technologies, first image processing, and then whole pipelines and databases, and as virtual observatory came in, and, and then machine learning and, and so on. And now we're very much into the regime of data exploration using artificial intelligence, machine learning tools. Okay, so circa turn of the millennium, it became clear to some of us, not just at Caltech, especially like my friend Alex Zalea, Johns Hopkins, and a few others, um, that this is not going to be the same old stuff. That the old approach of students reducing the data on their desktop or laptop is not going to scale, to survey scale astronomy. And so we came up with this concept of a virtual observatory. And in US, we call it the National Virtual Observatory, which became one of the highest priorities of the de to year 2000 decadal report from the Academy. And we were joking then that it's just like Holy Roman Empire. It was neither national, nor virtual, nor an observatory. But it was a nice catchy phrase and it took off. And basically what it was is to create the infrastructure for a whole data ecosystem that will have all of the different mission and survey and observatory archives connected by this middleware so that a scientist can then just go do one-stop shopping, find you know, all the data they need for a particular patch of the sky or a particular object and bring it together and then do something with it. And so this is one of those things that 
are so successful that it becomes completely unknown um, that it's simply assumed to be there. Like, you know, you don't think about electricity power grid <laughs> every day and, uh, or telephone uh, networks or anything like that. So my friends who are running virtual observatory federation uh what had even stickers that we put on laptop you know like mimicking intel inside they're saying vo inside um and so most astronomers use virtual observatory even though they don't realize it well what kind of science is it well it's a survey type science or multi-survey type science the Part of it is a combining data from different wavelengths, which is a very profitable thing to do. You know, you match optical and radio and infrared and whatever, and you see things that are present in the data, but cannot be seen in any one given data set separately. And so that's produced a lot of uh, kind of mapping things of large scale structure, the mapping of the Milky Way and so on. Another thing is to look for rare but interesting kind of things. And so if you're looking for something that's one in a million, you better have many millions of sources to look at. And so initially those were very high redshift quasars and brown dwarfs, but and then the strength, you know, anything else as well. So first one is do good statistics. Where you have billion stars, a billion galaxies, your Poissonian errors are no longer important. You have to worry about systematics. If you're looking for extremely rare things, you finally have a big enough pool of potential candidates. And then, of course, you can study the theoretical observations, these gigantic new simulations. Here is another example of what's, I would say, par excellence virtual observatory science. And you probably know about cosmic micro background is being used for so-called precision cosmology using these baby pictures of the universe the one on top left cosmic micro background signals bumps in the micro background sky um, are telling you a lot about cosmological parameters but you are not looking at cosmic micro background stratosphere directly there's a lot of stuff between us and micro background origin and there is different effects called Sinaevs of Dovich and gravitational lensing, et cetera, et cetera. And then by the time those microwave photons come to the Milky Way, well, we're looking through this shiny fog of hot dust and electrons and so on. And then there are other radio sources in between. And so you have to remove all these foregrounds before you can do cosmology. And that's exactly the kind of stuff. The virtual observatory is for you can then find old surveys on all these different wavelengths and you know come up with clever ways of subtracting these foreground signals before you can do what you really want to do okay so all that took off um europeans started right after us um and then in 2002 there, there was formation of the international virtual observatory alliance um, over 20 individual members. Everybody has their national name, like German Virtual Observatory and so on, because you know their governments, funding agencies give them the money for it. So you have to acknowledge that, even though we understood from the get-go that the universe doesn't care about boundaries on planet Earth, it doesn't care about wavelength domains that we give names, optical, visible, and on the infrared and whatnot. It really is continuum on the sky, spatially, wavelength-wise, and so on. And so this is a global astronomical enterprise, and, and it works very well. But some of the roots of this, one in particular, was digital digitized second polymer sky survey. And the other one was incipient Sloan Sky Survey that Alex Zalei was involved in, and then also was Tumas from IPAC and then everybody else. So we we kind of participated in, in really kind of birth of this whole big enterprise. But one thing that I always like to point out is the biggest impact of this, it may not be in places like Caltech. Um, you, some of you may have read way back then during the first 
internet boom, the book by Tom Friedman coined the book called The World is Flat, how the internet has leveled the playing field. And if you have internet connection, you can have a business or something. And as you know, that did a lot of global empowerment. But the same thing happens now with astronomy. The sky is also flat. And so the, anybody with an internet connection anywhere in the world can have the same access to interesting data as people at Caltech and Princeton and Harvard and whatnot, right? And since the human talent is distributed much more broadly geographically than money, this plays a very important role. And we've seen this happen in India from the get-go, where they have a lot of smart people and a lot of them are really good with computers. And India doesn't have telescopes to speak of. They're, that's why they're trying to buy into telescopes elsewhere. So I think this may be one of the biggest impacts that we democratized access to the astronomical data through this framework. All right. So this is what now modern scientific process looks like, illustrated here with astronomy, but the same thing applies everywhere else. You gather the data, you then do what I call data farming. You have to store it and index it and make it findable and combinable. And, and we know how to do this. Doesn't mean it's trivial, but we know how to do it. Then comes the real research part, which is knowledge discovery in these data sets. And that's where machine learning comes in. That's where a lot of challenges are. In the end, somehow you understood something new. Ta-da, published the paper. But it doesn't go like a waterfall like this. There are feedback loops between all of these steps all the time. You go back and change something and we measure something else and so on. So my encapsulation of what data-driven science is, really, there are really three pillars to it. First is that the information content of the data set, even individual ones, is so high that you can do profitable data mining. And uh, when I was a kid watching Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, I thought, ah, oh, that's how diamond mining works, right? They come in their fist size, then already polished, you just pick them from the mud. Um, but of course, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, the second part is data fusion that there is knowledge hidden in the data, individual data sets, which cannot be recognized by itself. But when you combine data sets, say from different wavelengths, ah, then you see something that you didn't realize was there before. And the multi-wavelength data fusion, it was a bread and butter of astronomy since really advent of radio astronomy. Um, that's how quasars were discovered, among other things. And the new thing is now the, the, the information content gets to be so complex that we need to expand human cognitive ability with prosthesis of machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to extract knowledge from this complex data. Well, this is also where astroinformatics came in. Um, so virtual observatory framework owes a lot to Caltech because we had the foundational conference in 2000 when the whole thing was launched. And then in 2010, we had the first worldwide astroinformatics conference. And the idea here was, okay, we built data garden, but now what? Now you have to discover stuff. And this is where all this machine learning stuff comes in, which is what VO was not doing. And you want to engage a very broad community of people. So essentially, it's astronomical application, what's now called data science, used to be called e-science or cyber science. And that's where all the action is. And in fact, this is going to be a perishable term because every science, strum included, is going to work like that. So there'll be no need to have astroinformatics, bioinformatics. That's just how strum and biology will be done. And that's, we're almost already there. So it's interesting, you know, all of sciences can stay around forever. And now we have these temporary sciences that are there to introduce given technology. And then that's just the way things are done. And there's no, no need to call them anything else. So those are really how the you know 20th century astronomy, 21st century astronomy will be done. And is done. Okay, well, back to our hero, Fritz Zwicky, our saint protector 
who built 18 inch there there is Swicky posing at it uh pretending to be observing um and he had a lot of brilliant ideas and also had a lot of crazy ideas and sometimes you couldn't really tell um and so one of the ideas that he he had that wasn't really appreciated early on was what he called the morphological box which we today would call parameter space he thought if you just think of all different things that properties that objects can have and you know partition them into these pseudo -cub cubicle voxels um then you can systematically explore which little boxes contain interesting stuff and and which do not and um he this was a marketing issue he should not have called it morphological box because you say word morphology people fall asleep All right so now we call this parameter space or a feature space and so there are several versions of that and so there is observable parameter space all the things that you could measure and so every astronomical observation carves out a little hyper volume in the space of what area in the sky how deep which wavelength what's the resolution and so on and so forth um, and then if you if you're also measuring things as a function of time you have a whole time axis and and so on and so every astronomical observation is limited by the limits of its design um, or the instrument and doesn't cover everything so you can then try to make plots which I show schematically here and see where did you look already and where haven't we looked maybe we should look there to see if some new stuff can be found anyway so you take this data you convert them into catalogs of sources and then sometimes just that gives you new stuff like on shown on the left is color color diagram from Sloan Sky Survey for point sources and black dots are stars they didn't plot bazillion stars in the middle they just shown contours in the white and the color dots are quasars and so ever since mid 90s this is how essentially all quasars have been found which now are over a million um that they look like stars but they behave differently in the simple parameter space of colors now if you me measure other things like distances and so on and have some theoretical understanding you can convert these observational measured properties into physical properties masses luminosities power size etc and then this is where the real science happens and so this is exact again the real data on what we called early type stellar systems elliptical galaxies dwarf spheroidals and globular clusters and they make distinct clouds in this parameter space of properties so this is how you can well first find out how many things are in your data but also classify them because for some things you only need stars or some things you only need elliptical galaxies and so on and you can also look for outliers what are the points that are kind of away from any one of the clouds and maybe something new and exciting that we didn't know about before so essentially exploration of these parameter spaces which is how physicists would call them or feature spaces as computer scientists call them and they're not phase spaces as some people mistakenly call them that phase space is something entirely different um is essentially where all the action happens so we have machine learning tools that find how these things cluster their correlations are the gaps are there outliers and so on and they're all things that you need to overcome which is incompleteness and noise and, and so on and so forth and so this is sort of the modern experimental science understanding how to apply these software tools uh, in these abstract data spaces which need not have three dimensions they have three thousand dimensions and, and so that makes things like really interesting and hard so here is my cartoon of what that might look like and um, so suppose you measure many different things thousands of things and they form some let's say three three thousand dimensional space of data and this is my 2d cartoon of 3d cube so data fill it up in some way not uniformly 
and their problems, sometimes their gaps, and sometimes they're not, sometimes. But somewhere in some little corner of this highly dimensional data space, there is something that's not noise. There is an interesting correlation, clustering of some sort, something that's really interesting that you didn't know about before. Um, and that's what we're looking for. Now, example I give to people is not from astronomy, but say, say you're doing a pharma pharmacological study, you're testing some cancer drugs, um, and you have data on patients, clinical data, demographic data, their genomic data, you know, and some drug only helps 0.1% of all patients. But there's one corner of space where it's 100% effective for those people. And so that's what you want to find out. And this is where all precision medicine is really heading to. So pharma, big pharma is using artificial intelligence, big deal these days. Well, what tools are there? <laughs> there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And a few simple ones, neural networks, random forest is something we teach students. But they're not all good for everything. So this is where the new skill comes in, understanding what type of algorithms and methods are really the right ones to use for your problem. Right? Um, this is why this is not just off the shelf. OK, I'm just going to take this commercial package, let it rip, and it's going to give me the result. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Well, all right. <laughs> But this is how we started too, um, and this this is a simple example of classifying sources detected in DPoS as either stars or galaxies. And trained observer can take a look and say, "Oh yeah, it's a star," or oh, "It's a fuzzy, it's a galaxy," right? Um, but when you have billions of sources, you can't do that. So we used simple uh, machine learning tools, neural networks, and decision trees. We taught them how to distinguish images of stars, images of galaxy, and then just do the whole thing. And so that was essentially using machine learning to re replace this repetitive, tedious process that humans could do, which is just too long. We now do a lot more interesting stuff with AI. And this, is, this was still one of the very first applications of machine learning in astronomy at all. And nowadays, the... Uh, the Papers that have machine learning or AI or deep learning in their abstract, they're currently over 1,000 per year, and they're doubling every 20 months. Gee, where did that come from, right? So I've seen only a tiny fraction of all machine learning literature in astronomy. Another example was, again, finding outlayers. That what's shown here is again one of those color color plots and black dots are stars and the other big dots were things that are not stars and we use that to find very distant quasars spectrum the lower right but then we also found things we didn't expect that had the same observational signatures they're also outliers they look like stars but they weren't stars and they weren't high redshift quasars either and it turned out to be a, an extremely rare, unusual type of so-called low broad, low excitation, broad absorption line quasars. But that that is exactly the kind of surprise you hope to find. Uh, and I can tell you, this was pretty baffling when we saw the spectrum come out of the double spectra the first time. And uh, it's like, what? Is the spectra have broken? What's going on here? Um, it wasn't broken. It was the first example of, of a small exclusive subtype of quasars. All right, so now we're getting into synoptic sky surveys, um, covering sky again and again. Um, and in fact, for many things, you have to do this in order to learn anything at all. So this time domain astronomy, which again, in large part was pioneered at Palomar, but also uh, by other groups at European Southern Observatory and so on, um, is all of the rage. This is what the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to be doing with their large survey of space and time, LSST, uh, looking for things that change. And that's what, exactly what ZTF does, only like 10% level of the LSST. 
So this process that I mentioned earlier of synergy of telescopes is that you optimize telescopes for what can be really done by them and not waste big telescope time on it still works we started it with epos and went through all versions of palomar transient factory now ztf that you use survey telescope process the data find things that could be interesting and then you kind of sift through them using 60 inch telescope or calibrate the data then you do more serious selection of candidates to find potentially interesting stuff and then you have to take spectra because that's usually where the science is and 200 inch, sometimes Keck directly, sometimes first 200 inch. Oh, this is really interesting. Let's go to Keck. And, and so we are optimizing use of each one of these observational assets. Um, and of course, you can use space facilities and radio telescopes and whatever, right? But that uh, whole kind of mini economy of telescope usage and purposes, and telescopes and computers, I should say is really how survey astronomy is done. And so first CCD camera on, on the 48 inch was not this. It was a so-called three shooter from JPL, three individual CCDs, which they used to look for earth crossing asteroids, the NEAT project. But then it was replaced by this camera built by Yale Experimental Physics Group, with Charlie Balte and collaborators. And with it, we did the first fully digital sky survey at Palomar, the Palomar Quest survey um, from about 2004 to about 2008 or so, when it was replaced by the first Palomar transient factory camera. Um, well, my old friend Charlie uh, was very proud that he got CCDs really cheap. Unfortunately, you get what you pay for. And so we spent huge amount of effort cleaning the data in software because the hardware really wasn't up to the snuff. Nevertheless, this camera was also used by Mike Brown to discover Sedna, first dwarf uh, planet, and led to the demise of Pluto and so on. And it's been then taken to European for uh, Schmidt telescope at ESO, where they used it to find supernovae. One thing that we did, with, which I'm really proud of, is so-called Big Picture Griffith Observatory. I don't know if you've seen it, and if you haven't, you really should, um, which is the largest astronomical image in the world still. And it's a little strip of the sky going through the core of the Virgo cluster. Uh, and it's like two degrees by, I forget, 15 degrees. Uh, Anyhow, it's 152 feet long by 20 feet high, and it consists of digital images that are printed, so to speak, on porcelain covering steel plates. And they've done this deliberately in order for it to be durable. In fact, this thing will be there for centuries, long after we're all gone. And they made it so that people can come directly to it and touch it and children can look at it. Um, and so then at night, somebody comes with Windex and cleans it all up. Um, but um, so far, this was seen by about 10 million visitors of Griffith Observatory. And, and, and that's quite a nice piece of public outreach. Well, here is the replacement for Palomar Quest camera. Uh, this one was professionally built by people who knew what they were doing. And there were, it was a Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, and she managed to persuade somebody to give him money to buy it outright from CFHT. And that's what formed Palomar Transient Factory Instrument, which was superior to, to the old Quest camera. Um, and then leading eventually to ZTF, now the really good camera that covers almost the entire focal plane and high quality images go a little deeper than the old photographic surveys, but cover huge areas of the sky every night. Um, and in trying to be um, kind of prototype for LSST, uh, they create alerts of anything that changed. It was different tonight than it was previously. <clears throat> 
which is how you look for transient events that some of them are potentially interesting. Now, LSST built in a strategy that they'll measure all kinds of stuff and anything that changed it significantly, whether it's brightness or motion because it's an asteroid or something, will be called a transient. And they will send alert for every one of those and they anticipate to send 10 million of them every night. And of those 10 million, about 10 million are of no interest whatsoever. Uh, they're just astronomical spam. But somewhere, it'd be like 10 or 100 that are potentially interesting. And so ZTF is now producing million of these alerts every night. But again, maybe 10 of those are really worth following up, taking a spectrum and, and so on. And so learning how to go from vast amount of stuff that maybe could be interesting, but almost surely isn't, uh, into those that you really shouldn't miss is a highly non-trivial problem for machine learning. Well, there is all kinds of exciting science that can be done in time domain, um, all kinds of cosmic explosions, looking for killer asteroids as well. Um, and in some sense, we now added this extra dimension to observable parameter space, where instead of static sky, we talk about dynamic sky, that things change all the time. And instead of sources, we talk about events. Event is a spatiotemporal thing, not just a spatial thing, which is a source. And so surveys are discovery engines. We combine them with other things that leads to understanding. Uh, and actually, I think we've done so well at Palomar that this is, this is no longer going to be a really exciting frontier. Uh, by the time LSST really starts rolling, we pick all the low-hanging fruit. So as you probably know, cosmic explosions are a major driver for a lot of people, including Sri Gulkarni, who was who's the, who's the PI of all this. Um, all manner of different types of supernovae, and, and then, of course, gravitational wave events, uh, Mansi Castlewell is following, and, and so on before that with the gamma ray burst and so on and so forth. So that occupies us a lot of the synoptic sky surveying. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this because I'm sure you have heard it about it already from somebody else or will, definitely will. Um, so there is a, but there is an interesting challenge here. So you take these pictures, you compare them to baseline and there is a star that's brighter tonight than it used to be. And that's all you know about it. And it can be vastly different physical phenomena behind it, some of which are more interesting than others. So how do you choose which ones out of million or so uh, are you going to follow up? Because most of them are really just some variable star of no interest whatsoever. Well, so we have to do classification of these transient events and we have to do it in real time because they're perishable. Tomorrow the thing may fade out. Um, and so you operate on very sparse data set with very heterogeneous background collection of data and you have to make this decision of whether or not to turn big telescope at it. We've been at this for almost 20 years now. And it's still not fully solved problem. We made progress, all right. I mean, things happen, but um, but it's a really difficult issue. One of the difficulties, and if I can just illustrate how machine learning is used in this, is so we measure brightness as a function of time of some source. I mean, this is a, some variable star. Each dot is a measurement. The this is over several years. I forget exactly. And you can see that there are gaps because you don't do the same field all year long and sometimes it's cloudy and, and so on. And so it's a very sparse, in, inhomogeneous data set. And some other star will be a, a whole different time series with the different gaps and so on. So how do you process data that are inherently highly heterogeneous? Well, here's the trick. We replace the data with parameters that measure the whole time series. So we have about 70 different computational parameters, statistical parameters that describe these 
time series. And now for every one of them, we have same set of 70 numbers. Now those form what we call feature space that now we can use machine learning to separate different kinds of things because different kinds of things will cluster in different way depending on you know, what you're looking at. You know, quasars versus cataclysmic variables versus erupting stars and so on. But it turns out you can't really run machine learning on 70 different parameters for large amounts of data. Uh, scalability is not there. So you have to select which axes of the 70 dimensional space are really the right axes to look at. And so thankfully, there are tools to do this They're called feature selection techniques. And what's shown here on the top right are two of those time series for two different variable stars. One of them is pulsating variable, RLRI. The other one is an eclipsing binary that one star calls the other. Both are periodic, but very different physics behind. And so we run this feature selection machinery and it rank orders for us which of the 70 different parameters will be most powerful in separating them. You pick top three and boom, it separates the two clouds of data points really nicely. Now you'd be hard pressed to tell what the heck is any one of those, never mind the two different kinds of things. But you do this type of uh, machine learning uh, magic, and here we go. So this is the kind of stuff that we now do all the time. Um, let me turn on to quasars and black holes. Um, as you probably know, quasars are highly luminous objects powered by supermassive black holes. The top image is famous image of M87 from Earth Event Horizon Telescope. Then underneath is a cartoon of stuff swirling, falling into black hole. And it doesn't do this uniformly. So it, the brightness vary and there is a light curve at the bottom for some quasar that just goes up and down. Well, this time variability actually reflects the physics of what goes in. And so we've been studying that and also using it to find quasars and separate them from regular stars. I'm running out of time, so I'll cover this very quickly. First of all, we found a way that we combine measurements of these time series with data from Y satellite to separate stars from quasars, and we found an optimal way to find quasars with Initially, it was like 100% reliable. Now it's more like 90 some percent. But previously, it was like 60% reliability methods. So now we're kind of working towards a catalog of about 4 million quasars over the sky um, using also Gaia data. Uh, and that's going to be all of them down to the limit of these surveys. And uh, so that's a whole different all game from what people used to do. Uh, the first quasar survey was done at Palomar with uh, Martin Schmidt and Richard Green, who was his first grad student. And there are like hundred some objects in it. Well, now we're talking about millions. Um, and so that's what big data science is like. Okay, but here is the really interesting one that I, I love. And this is an example of time domain astronomy that's not about explosion, something that just happened tonight, but rather you look at long-term behavior of objects in your archive. And we have unprecedented data on that with hundreds or thousands of data points spanned up to you know, 20 years between different surveys and nothing like that ever existed before. So one, we, we found all, all manner of interesting things about quasars, but there is the one that I really like. Now, something that we now know is that the way galaxies evolve in the universe is they often collide, and when they collide, they eventually merge. And we also now know that every big galaxy has a big black hole in the middle, like Milky Way has a 4 million solar mass black hole, and people got Nobel Prize for finding them. Um, so what happens to those black holes when they're host galaxies merge. Well, eventually, those black holes will merge too. They'll first orbit along the common center of mass, then lose energy to gravitational waves, and then 
and merge in a big burst of gravitational waves. It's just like LIGO events for stellar mass black holes, except 10 million times bigger. Um, and this has to happen if we understand anything about structure formation in the universe. But these would not be resolvable by any current or imaginable imaging technology. So you have to look for something else. So if there is a system of two big black holes orbiting each other, they can modulate the emission from the accreting disk. So you have a periodic signal superposed on this kind of random stock market-like variations of brightness. So we have to separate those two. And lo and behold, we found almost 100 of those. This was the first one. And it keep doing the same kind of oscillation that we've seen originally. A period is about four years or so. And the numbers of these objects that we find are exactly what theory predicts. Um, and there is no guarantee. You know, they can always be chanced fluctuation, but you know, you have to keep collecting the data. But we think at least half of them are definitely pairs of supermassive black holes are orbiting each other. Well, one more thing about machine learning. Um, actually, let me skip this one because I want to wrap up this. So there are two big challenges in dealing with these data. The first one, which is relatively easier to understand is visualization. Because we have to look at what we're doing, look at our data at every step from cleaning the data to choosing the right tools to you know, finding and understanding results, presenting results to our colleagues and so on. Now, all of you are familiar with the expression garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data, you're gonna get bad results. Ah. But even if you have perfectly good data, but make a wrong choice of the analysis algorithm, and those things are now very not trivial, you can still get garbage out from good data. So it's really important to be able to see what you're doing and experiment and, and refine and so on. But the problem is we only see three dimensions. Well, Turns out this is again where an emerging technology helps, not machine intelligence, but the way of human in computer interaction, which has evolved in time from you know punch cards and paper tape through you know desktops and laptops and mobile computing. And the next thing is the extended reality. Currently, there are these clunky headsets, but those will go away. Um, and we'll be using three-dimensional visual interfaces to interact with machines. Uh, and do everything now we do in flat video. Well, it turns out this is by far the best data visualization methodology ever. And if you encode dimensions of your data space, not just X, Y, Z, but you use colors and shapes and transparency and so on and so forth, you can encode up to 10 dimensions of these abstract spaces in something that people can understand. The scientists can walk into their own data and look around, interact with their colleagues who may be across the world, interact with machine learning. And it was found in a variety of different fields that this three-dimensional exploration gives you, triggers your pattern recognition much better than any traditional flat screen visualization. And it also makes you understand and, and remember things better. So that was another thing that was driven, starting with trying to analyze data from deep sky survey, running into an issue of high dimensionality data spaces, finding this um, that extended reality technology, virtual reality, augmented reality can help. And we even have a startup company that, that has commercialized uh, the tool, which originally was motivated trying to understand data from digital polymer with a sky survey. All right, now things get to be really interesting, which is all about AI. So if you think about what's the, what's the science all about? Science is there to just summarize the overall messy phenomenology seen in the world into a small set of rules, like laws of nature, like laws of physics. And so instead of you know many different manifestations, you understand there is this, Law of physics that makes it do whatever. Well, 
All the simple stuff's been done. Now we see highly complex data sets that probably hide highly complex new laws of nature. A colleague of mine pointed out that all laws of physics, all fundamental formulas of physics have at most three variables in them. Is that because that's the way nature is or is it just because we couldn't think beyond three dimensions? Well, that's an interesting question. So we're now marching towards collaborative human computer discovery. And this is also not a new idea. Uh, Vannevar Bush wrote famous article called As We May Think in 1945. Um, he predicted the rise of the World Wide Web. And this other computer scientist, cognitive scientist, JCR Licklater, wrote a visionary paper in 1960 called The Man Computer Symbiosis. They didn't have the technology back then, but they definitely had the vision. So here is my one slide history of artificial intelligence. It starts with Alan Turing of Turing Test, with uh, his computing machinery intelligence paper in 1950. Then there is JCR with his paper. And by the way, he was a DARPA manager who funded development of the internet. So you, you have that man to thank for the existence of the internet. As I mentioned, we started using machine learning tools in the early 90s to analyze big data and astronomy. And then with the internet boom, all kinds of things happen. Every time you use Google or any other search engine, you're talking to machine intelligence. You can literally talk to machine intelligence with Siri and Alexa and so on. And of course, uh, great milestone 2012. Google recognizes pictures of cats because what else are computers for? Right. But here is the interesting one. Until 98, people saying, yeah, yeah, computers are good, but they'll never be able to beat humans in chess because that's such an intuitive, complex game. Well, Gary Kasparov found out that's not so. So since 98, computers were the world chess champions. Humans don't even play against them anymore. And people said, okay, fine, chess is complicated, but Go, the Japanese game, is much more intuitive and difficult and all that. Well, in 2016, computer beat human Go champion. And they trained the machine on the basis of previous games, like that was done in the past. And then they gave computer just the rules of the game and let it develop its own strategies. And that beat the previous computer world champion. Um, what caught my attention about this is this statement that machine has discovered strategies to win this highly complex game, just starting from the rules of the game, no reading books or seeing previous games, that humans have not found in 2000 years. And that is exactly what we want. We don't want machines to just mimic what we do. We want machines to supplement what we do. So the different version of this computer machinery is called AlphaFold. And almost two years ago, they announced the result that they solved a problem that biologists couldn't solve for decades called protein folding problem. Um, because the space of possible configuration is so vast that no amount of supercomputer can help you. And yet, here AI has found solution, which is now completely changing the way molecular biology is done. And to my, mind, to my knowledge, this is the first time that AI has made a discovery that humans could not. And maybe just a preview of coming attractions. So, Essentially, what we've done is we created an alien intelligence on planet Earth, and it works differently from the way ours works. And it can hopefully help, help us find things in these increasingly interesting, increasingly information-rich data that we're gathering, things that we would never see on our own, so, and help us make discoveries. So genuine human-computer collaborative discovery. And that raises all manner of other interesting questions that we don't have to got time to go through. So let me wrap up. Um, basically, all sciences, like pretty much everything in the modern world, 
are being completely transformed by computer technology. Um, and we're living we now in the era, not just big data, but big data plus artificial intelligence, which is what leads us to make these new discoveries. Um, and we're just starting. I mean, the Moore's law keeps ticking and AI keeps getting more amazing year after year. Um, and we'll probably be interacting with data and machine intelligences in some form of extended reality in not too distant future. All right, so I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Wow, <clears throat> wow. George, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, it was a tremendous, tremendous tour through this subject. Um, may I encourage people to turn on their microphones and um, ask questions? Please, anybody. Uh, Steve and John Greif, I have a question in the chat if you want to take a look. Okay, I'll stop screen sharing so I can see the chat. All right. Oh, good. First one says, I hate Zoom. Me too. Yeah. Um, okay. Done. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck with it. Let was me there. read your question. Um, Wait, this is about cancer related databases. Well, oh yeah, there are always errors. Um, that's that's what people are for. Computers make no errors, but people do. Um, that is certainly a good point. Machine learning is only as good as the training data set that you provide to it. And in fact, I would say most cases we spend 80% of effort just cleaning the data before we do the real thing. Um, now there is hope, which is that there are ways in which AI can help us find obvious errors in the data and just block those data or repair them in some way and so on. There is a danger there that usually there are some assumptions of what data ought to look like, uh, kind of built-in biases, so that you may be missing a genuine, interesting outlier. And so there is no magical solution to this, but there are a lot of people who are thinking exactly about how to do this. Um, let's see. Yes, Xavier, uh, I'm sorry, set, set. Or Sotaro, you had a question. We want to turn on your microphone and jump in with it. Um, sure. Um, no, I, I was just, I was just kind of wondering. Obviously, AI. I guess where is the the where do we draw the line in the sand for for assurity of the science? Because AI is going to escape from our capabilities within our brains. So I thought of an example. So AI, in, and especially the surveying, can really help in, in seeing things that are not visible, um, and, and that are part of that, you know, for example, uh, black matter, right? Kind of the glue that we necessarily don't have the science to measure it. And I think AI will, but how do we assure that that information is actually the accuracy of that information? Um well, the, those are different things here. The, the first part is accuracy of the input data, which is what we just talked about, that uh, if you give bad data to to machine learning system, it can be misled. Machine learning systems trust you. But there is a whole another issue here, which is explainable AI, which is another very vibrant uh, field of computer science. How do we understand why did machine learning told us something? Why did it come up with that particular solution, not something else? And so there are actually people working on, on trying to kind of deproject, reverse engineer, as, as you say, or uh, understand why this is. And in fact, 
visualization ought to be a big part of that because visualization is our bridge between data and human intuition and understanding of what's going on. So it's a very active area of work. And as usual in science, you don't trust just one finding like, oh, that's really interesting. And then people try to uh, replicate it in different ways, using different data, using slightly different approaches and, and so on. So the same thing will happen now. It's not like someday, you know, AI said, okay, we we'll analyzed all of the data from cosmological surveys and the dark matter is blah. And then, well, okay, if that's so, then you, there's got to be some predictions. If, if that's the correct interpretation, then something else ought to be observable, measurable. And so people go and check and, and things like that. So in some sense, it's no different from the way we do science now, um, that you always want to have things, uh, to have things that are testable, make predictions that you can check, that are re replicable. Um, biomedical sciences are notorious about this. The vast fraction of all published medical results are actually wrong because they cannot be replicated because not because people are stupid but because it's such a complex phenomenon dealing with you know, human body and health so we'll just chug along but on the other hand time will come when we will just simply have to take ai on its word so to speak now think about this people use technology without having a blessed clue how it works how many people have any understanding how their computer or cell phone works right so they just trust is going to happen and sometimes that's a misplaced trust but um this is what well, i would say the role of the scientist will remain uh, to serve as this final filter of does this make sense do i really understand it you know have we learned something or not but those those are really good questions that are no there are no answer, good answers to it and the thing is that this field is developing so fast that we don't have really the experience to draw upon right um, and the analogies with past scientific or technological revolutions will only go so far so we're kind of learning as we go along and then there is all manner of other stuff that, like ethics of, of AI use and, and so on. That um, it, it really is a whole new world out there. Um, and we're just kind of fumbling our way through it. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. It also, I mean, maybe a, maybe a dumb comment, but, you know, I was thinking, how do we analyze when, you know, what is AI going to, uh, when it dreams, what is it going to dream? <laughs> right well <laughs> depends what you mean by dream um but uh one quick answer is you probably have seen online there are now pictures that are created by ai on the basis of images it sees on the web and human prompt yeah um and absolutely those, those yeah. Are like surreal looking things um, and so in some sense, some examples of what's inside these deep learning networks, you can call that AI dreams. Um, but then again, it reflects the input data. Great example. Thank you. Yeah. Well, George, you've, you've been very generous with your time. And I, I suspect we could go on for a while, but I think... We're, we're an hour and a half into this. I think we need to wind, wind the meeting down. I guess I'd like to finish with a question Robert Baker has in the chat. Um, Robert, would, would you want to jump in and, and ask it? Or? Well. Okay, he asks what, what we you know, if, if, you're in, if you're in high school, if you're a kid growing up, what what kinds of things do you need? How would you prepare for a, a a career in you know this this kind of this kind of 
environment, in the emerging environment of science that mm. is caused by big data? Well, yes, you have to study uh, this methodology of data science. Also, that means you need to understand other things like statistics and, and experimental method and, and stuff like that. So traditional science education plus applied computer science engineering. Sometimes I tell people like data science is actually not a science. It is a collection of methodologies which mostly derive from computer science engineering, applied computer science engineering, some statistics, some applied math. And it only becomes alive when it's applied in a given, in a given domain, whether it's astronomy or biology or geophysics or whatever. Um, but it's the underlying methodology in the same sense that it's like calculus or statistics are underlying methodologies. They're universal for all sciences. So, so the problem is that, well, we don't teach it quite as much as we should yet. The good news is there is computer technology is changing another industry in the education. And so there is a huge amount of excellent online stuff uh, in the form of MOOCs or, or, or online tutorials and, and so on that people can just learn at their own pace. And sometimes, you know, there are ways of interacting with, with other students and so on. So that is a whole another story, right? That uh, by and large, uh, professors don't tend to keep up with this kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of people tend to use what they did when they were in grad school. And that's just not going to work when you have something that changes in time skills of a year or two. But what I see now is that new generations of students already come in prepared and they're eager and willing and able to learn all these things um, even though their professors can't really help them much. Now, mind you, this is not studying computer science, which is like 150% task in of itself, but just studying classes that are how do you use things that computer scientists have invented like neural networks what does this mean how does it work you know that kind of thing um and there is more and more excellent stuff online because school system and universities are far too inert to to change fast enough to provide um, this essential education of 21st century We've been having class in astroinformatics for a long time now, and Caltech now has data science major and minor, and it's always about apply, applying things in some different field. But uh, it, it may not be changing fast enough. On the other hand, you know, I, I have great hope that um, education industry, as we know it, will go belly up. And it's about time because um, everything internet touches gets completely transformed. You know, th think about music industry or, or movie industry or newspapers, or, right? You know, they still kind of chug along, but they better adapt to, to the new things. Like who goes to theater anymore if you have Netflix, right? Um, and who reads paper, printed paper newspaper as opposed to getting their news real or fake online. Um, so yeah, it, it's, um, it's a very changing world, but I, I, you know, I, I have hope that young people who are much more savvy about these things will make good decisions about it. A, a, a vision, a remarkable vision of the future um, thank you, and I think I think we're all going to have to process yeah. some well, of this here a little bit. Thank you all for putting up with me uh, for an hour and a half, and um, have a great time. And I'd like to close the meeting out by mentioning our next program in two weeks. Uh, the Greenway Talks will continue on Saturday, November 19th, when our guest speaker will be Caltech professor of astronomy, Greg Hallinan. Oh, good.
in his role as director of Caltech's Owen Valley Radio Observatory, Professor Hallinan is preparing to build a new and very large telescope. At our meeting, he will present his plans for the deep synoptic array named DSA 2000. It will be a survey instrument and in his words, the largest radio telescope ever built, spanning 285 square kilometers in Nevada, DSA 2000 will link together 2,005 meter dishes to create a radio counterpart to the transformative astronomical surveys of the 2020s, which we just heard a great deal about actually. Again, thank you to, uh, to Professor George Jagowski and my thanks to you all as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting the Greenway Talks online. Come up to the observatory now if you can. And with that, I'll close the meeting and see you on November 19th. Bye everybody. Outstanding.